Hello and welcome. In this video, I will go over everything you need to know for AP Calculus BC. I will not only tell you the content, but I'll also give you an intuition for why many of the ideas are true. This video is part two of a series. Part one is a 20 minute video where I go over all the AB content, as well as an effective studying strategy for any class. If you haven't watched that yet, make sure to check that out first. Link will be in the description or the pinned comment. For this video, we will start off with miscellaneous topics that are not covered in AB before going into parametrics, vectors, and polars, and finally finishing off with infinite sequences and series. Just like the AB video, each section will start off with an overview. Here is the overview for section one. Pause to read over it. So integration by parts is a great integration technique when you want to integrate the product of two functions where one is easy to differentiate and the other is easy to integrate. In x cosine of x, the derivative of x is 1, and the integral of cosine x is sine x. So using the integration by parts formula, this integral becomes x sine x minus the integral of 1 times sine x dx. The integral of sine x dx is negative cosine x, so the final answer is x sine x plus cosine x plus c. Sometimes you need to use integration by parts multiple times. For the integral of e to the x cosine x dx, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and the integral of cosine x is sine x, so the integral becomes e to the x sine x minus the integral of e to the x sine x dx. Then we can use integration by parts again, so the integral of e to the x sine x dx becomes negative e to the x cosine x, because the integral of sine x is negative cosine x, minus the integral of negative e to the x cosine x dx. After simplifying, we notice that the integral of e to the x cosine x dx appears on both sides, so we can add it to both sides and divide by 2 to get our final answer. Partial fraction decomposition is great when you want to integrate a rational function where the denominator is a factored polynomial. To integrate this function, we would break it down into partial fractions. Now, here is a quick technique to solve for a and b. To solve for a, you would set x equal to the value that will make the coefficient of b equal to 0. In this case, we set x equals 0 0.5 to get that a equals negative 2. Similarly, to solve for b, you would set x equal to the value that would make the coefficient of a equal to 0. In this case, we set x equals negative 4 to get b equals 3. Plugging the values for a and b back, now we have a simple integral that can be solved using u substitution. So here is our final answer. So here's an example of an improper integral. 1 over square root of x is unbounded as x approaches 0, but 0 is one of our bounds of integration. To solve this integral, we would change the lower bound to n and take the limit as n approaches 0 from above. Using the product rule, the indefinite integral of 1 over square root of x is 2 times the square root of x, and we evaluate that from n to 1. Now we can just use direct substitution to solve the limit, and we get that the answer is 2. Euler's method is a way to get numerical approximations to the solution of a differential equation. In this problem, we have an initial condition at x equals 0, and we want to approximate f of 2.4 with two steps of equal size. That means the step size, h, is 1.2. To solve this problem, it's best to create a table containing x, y, dy over dx, and the change in y. Now we solve for dy over dx at our initial point 0, 0,2. We get negative 2, so the change in y is negative 2 times 1.2, or negative 2.4 and our next y value is 2 minus 2.4, or negative 0.4. Now, evaluating dy over dx at 1.2 comma negative 0.4, we get 4, so the change in y is 4.8, and our new y value is negative 0.4 plus 4.8, which is 4.4, and that is the answer to the problem. Logistic growth is modeled with the differential equation dy over dx equals ky times a minus y. And the solution may look something like this. From this graph, we can see that the carrying capacity is 2 because y approaches 2 as x increases. If you're given a logistic growth equation to solve for the carrying capacity, solve for dy over dx equals 0. One solution is y equals 0, and the other solution, in this case y equals 15, is the carrying capacity. The y value for which dy over dx is maximized is half the carrying capacity. Now we're getting into section 2. Here is the overview slide. Pause to read over it. We'll start with determining the first and second derivative of parametrics. If you're given y and x as a function of t, the first derivative, dy over dx, is given by y prime of t over x prime of t. In this case, it's 2e to the 2t divided by e to the t, 
which is just 2e to the t. To get the second derivative, you differentiate the first derivative with respect to t and divide by x prime of t, and you will get 2. Now let's walk through a sample FRQ problem you may see on the exam. A particle moving along a curve in the xy plane is at position x of t comma y of t at time t greater than zero. The particle moves in such a way that dx over dt equals t squared and dy over dt equals ln of one plus t. At time t equals four, the particle is at the point one comma five. A, what is the speed and acceleration vector of the particle at t equals four? Well, to determine the speed, you use the formula square root of vx squared plus vy squared. The velocities are just the derivatives of the positions with respect to time, and you're already given the derivatives in the problem. So you just plug in t equals 4 and get approximately 16.081. Remember to round to three decimal places. The acceleration vector is x double prime of t comma y double prime of t. So by differentiating the velocities that you're given and plugging in t equals 4, you get a comma 0.2. B, what is the y-coordinate of the particle's position at time t equals 6? Remember that the y-displacement, or change in y, is equal to the integral of the y-velocity from t equals 4 to 6. You want to solve for y of 6, so you move y of 4 over to the other side, and you can use your calculator to evaluate the integral from 4 to 6 of ln of 1 plus t dt. Since you're given y of 4 equals 5 in the problem, the answer is approximately 8.574. C, what is the total distance the particle travels from time t equals four to t equals six? The formula for distance is the integral of speed from t equals four to six. We've seen the formula for speed in part A, and we can use a graphing calculator to get the answer is approximately 50.797. Determining the derivative of polar curves is essentially the same as parametric curves, as long as you realize x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. So now we'll jump right into the area of polar curves. Here's an example. The polar curve for r of theta equals 1 minus 2 theta is shown. Find the integral that represents the shaded area r. The key part of these problems is finding the bounds. As you can see, the shaded area begins at the origin, where r of theta equals 0. So solving for theta, you get that the lower bound is theta equals 1 half. And be careful of the upper bound. It may initially seem the upper bound is theta equals 3 pi over 2 because the area is contained inside the third quadrant, but the upper bound is actually theta equals pi over 2 because r of pi over 2 is negative. And the formula for area, which you saw on the overview slide, integral of 0.5 r of theta squared d theta is very simple. And now you just plug everything in to get the answer. For the area bounded by two curves, the main part of the problem is also determining the bounds. Here's an example. The polar curves for r of theta equals 2 sine of 2 theta and r of theta equals 2 sine of theta are shown. They intersect at theta equals pi over 3. Find an integral that represents the shaded area r. Well, as you can see, the blue curve bounds the area from theta equals 0, which you can get by solving 2 sine of theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 3, where the curves intersect and the pink curve bounds the area from pi over three to pi over two, which is determined by solving two sine of two theta equals zero. The final step is to add the areas bounded by each of these two curves. Last, but certainly not least, infinite sequences in series. This section has an overview that is three slides long. Here is the first slide, here is the second slide, and here is the last slide. So an infinite series converges if the nth partial sum approaches a certain value as n approaches infinity. An example is the series of 1 over n squared from n equals 1 to infinity. The graph shows the first few partial sums, and as you approach infinity, the partial sum approaches the value indicated by the red line. You don't need to know what this value is, but if you're curious, it's pi squared divided by 6. On the other hand, if we consider the series negative 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, and so on, the nth partial sum continuously oscillates between negative 1 and 0, so the limit as n approaches infinity of the partial sum doesn't exist, and the series diverges. There are many tests for convergence and divergence. The first is the nth term test, which states that if the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth term doesn't equal 0, the series diverges. We can use this to prove that the second series we just saw diverges. 
the nth term oscillates between negative one and one, so the limit as n approaches infinity doesn't exist, and hence the series diverges. The integral test. So let's consider the harmonic series, one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth, and so on. Notice if we graph one over x, then the value of this series is just the area of a left Riemann sum from one to infinity. And this is pretty similar to the integral from one to infinity of one over x dx. It turns out that the behavior of the integral is the same as the series. If we evaluate this improper integral by changing the upper bound to n and taking the limit as n approaches infinity, we get that the integral equals infinity, so the series diverges. Here's another example. The series of one over n, natural log of n from n equals two to infinity. To determine whether that converges or diverges, we would take the integral of one over x ln of x dx from two to infinity. This is an improper integral that could be evaluated using u substitution by setting u to ln of x. And it evaluates to ln of ln of absolute value x from two to n. As n approaches infinity, this equals infinity, so the series diverges. The p-series test states that the series of one over n to the p from n equals one to infinity converges if p is greater than one and diverges if p is less than or equal to one. This test could be proved using the integral test. The comparison test. If each term of a n is less than or equal to the corresponding term in b n and every term is non-negative, then if the series of a n diverges to infinity, the series of b n must also diverge while if the series of bn converges, then the series of a must also converge. This is another way to prove the divergence of the harmonic series. Consider the series of a n equals one half plus one half plus one fourth plus one fourth plus one eighth four times plus one sixteenth eight times and so on. Notice how each term in this series is less than or equal to the corresponding term in the harmonic series. In our first series, starting with one fourth, if we group together the terms with the same denominators in parentheses, each of these groups evaluates to one half. So the series of an equals one half plus one half plus one half and so on, which diverges to infinity. So the series of bn, the harmonic series, also diverges. The limit comparison test states that if the limit as n approaches infinity of an over bn equals a finite number other than zero, then the series of an and bn either both converge or both diverge. So consider the series of one over n squared minus 0.5 from n equals one to infinity. We can compare that with the series of one over n squared, which converges by the p-series test. The limit as n approaches infinity of the ratio of the terms of the series equals one. So the series both converge. The alternating series test. Consider the series one minus one half plus one third minus one fourth and so on. The magnitude of each term is less than or equal to the magnitude of the previous term and the limit as n approaches infinity of a n equals zero. Therefore, this series converges. The intuition behind this is that partial sums that end with the positive term provide an upper bound for the value of the infinite series and partial sums that end with the negative term provide a lower bound. In this graph of partial sums, you can see that S4 and S5 provide an upper and lower bound. And if the nth term converges to zero, then the upper and lower bound converge to the same value, the value of the infinite series. We'll come back to the ratio test. For now, we'll talk about conditional and absolute convergence. So we determined that the alternating series from last slide converges, but if we instead change all the terms to being positive, then we get the harmonic series, which diverges. Since the alternating series converges, but the series of the absolute values of the terms diverges, this alternating series is conditionally convergent. A fun fact called the Riemann rearrangement theorem is that for series that converge conditionally, it is possible to change the result of the series by rearranging the terms. The intuition is that if we group up all the positive terms and all the negative terms, we get infinity minus infinity, which is indeterminate. It could evaluate to anything. So it turns out that our alternating series from earlier evaluates to ln of two, but if we instead change the series to adding the first two positive terms, then subtracting the first negative term, then adding the next two positive terms, then subtracting the second negative term, and so on, this new series converges to three halves ln of two. You don't need to remember this theorem or know how to evaluate these series, but it's a pretty interesting result.
The maximum amount by which a partial sum of an alternating series differs from the value of the infinite series is the absolute value of the first term that's not included in the partial sum because that's the distance between the upper and lower bounds. So in the alternating series, one minus one half plus one third minus one fourth and so on, the maximum error of S4 is the absolute value of A5, which is one fifth. The key to finding the Taylor polynomial approximation to a function is remembering the formula from the overview slides. This formula is very important to remember. So to find the second degree Taylor polynomial approximation for sine x centered at x equals pi over two, we just plug the values in. The zero first and second derivatives of sine of x evaluated at pi over two are sine of pi over two, cosine pi over two, and negative sine of pi over two respectively. And you can simplify. If you're curious, here's what the graphs of sine x and our Taylor polynomial approximation look like. Now we're asked for the maximum error in using the Taylor approximation to approximate sine of three pi over two. To do this, we just need to plug the values into the formula. The tricky part is m. In this case, m is an upper bound of the third derivative of sine x, which is negative cosine x, when evaluated between pi over two and three pi over two. Fortunately, we know that the upper bound of sine or cosine of anything is one. So m equals one. Plugging that in, we get pi cubed over six as our final answer. Since this is a tricky concept, here is another example. Estimating ln of 0 0.75 using Taylor polynomial centered at x equals one, what is the minimum degree necessary to ensure an error of less than 0 0.001? And it gives you the k plus one derivative of ln of x. So once again, we plug the values into the formula. And since we're given the information about m, we can plug it in ignoring the negative one to the n since we're dealing with magnitude. Z is between 0 0.75 and one. After simplifying, notice that Z to the K plus one is in the denominator. And that means that the maximum value of M is achieved when Z is as close to zero as possible. So that means Z equals 0 0.75. And we end up with this inequality. Using a calculator, you can try a few integer values for K and you'll find that the lowest value where this is satisfied is k equals four. So a fourth degree Taylor polynomial is needed. The ratio test, let L equals the limit as N approaches infinity of the absolute value of a n plus one over a n. If L is less than one, the series must converge. If L is greater than one, the series must diverge. If L equals one, this test is inconclusive. This test can be used to determine the interval of convergence of power series such as x plus 2x squared plus 3x cubed plus 4x to the fourth and so on. If we evaluate L, we will get that it is just equal to the absolute value of x. This must be less than one, so we get the open interval from negative one to one. Now we must check the endpoints, x equals negative one and one. At those values, the power series becomes negative one plus two minus three plus four dot 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 and one plus two plus three plus four dot 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 respectively. Due to the nth term test, neither of these converges, so the final answer is just the open interval from negative one to one. The ratio test, power series, and interval of convergence are very important concepts. Make sure you remember them. Taylor series. So this formula is the same as the Taylor approximation, except n goes to infinity. Using this formula with a equals zero, you can find the Maclaurin series of key functions. These are also quite useful to remember. By manipulating them, you can get the Maclaurin series of similar functions. For example, this question asks you what function this Maclaurin series corresponds to. Well, as soon as you see 2n factorial in the denominator, you should instantly think cosine. By using exponent rules, you could change the x to the 4n plus 2 to x squared to the 2n times x squared. You can then factor out x squared, and the series is now just the Maclaurin series of cosine of x squared. Similarly, you can perform term-by-term -term differentiation or integration to manipulate series. This question asks you to find the function corresponding to the series x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 plus x to the fourth over 4 dot 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 in the given interval. Well, notice that each term is the integral of the corresponding term in the power series 1 over 1 minus x, which equals 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed dot dot dot. So by integrating both sides, you can get that the answer to the original problem is negative ln of the absolute value of one minus x. 
All right, we're done. I hope that was super helpful. If you enjoyed it, check out the rest of my channel for more fun and useful educational content. Thanks for watching and have a great day.